Thanks to everyone for joining us. This is the American Values Coalition, and uh, this is our webinar on Christian nationalism and threats to democracy. We'll be talking about the book, The Flag and the Cross, White Christian Nationalism and a Threat to, Demo to Democracy. The authors are Philip Gorski and Samuel Perry, who is joining us today. Philip Gorski is professor of sociology at Yale University and also the author of American Babylon, Christianity and Democracy Before and After Trump. Samuel Perry is associate professor of sociology at University of Oklahoma, and he is the co-author uh, co of Taking America Back for God, Christian Nationalism in the United States. This is a book that laid some of the groundwork for the book that we're talking about today. Uh, so at the American Values Coalition, our mission is growing a community of Americans empowered to lead with truth, reject extremism and misinformation and defend democracy. So we've, we're, we're tackling this problem of uh, uh, political extremism from uh, many different angles. This is our first time doing a webinar on Christian nationalism uh, and one that we think uh, does a lot to explain a, a lot of the political extremism that's going on today. And there's a lot of people doing work in this area. So hopefully this is not the, uh, we expect that there'll be future webinars on this same topic as well. Uh, so the format that we're going to go th through is uh, first, the authors will uh, summarize uh, the main points of the book. I'll, I'll ask some questions, and then we're going to open it up to audience questions. At that time, you'll be able to put your question in the Q&A chat. If you look down at the bottom of your screen, there's one that says Q&A. Just click on that, put your question in there, and we'll try to get to as many of those as possible. Please keep your question on topic. <laughs> Okay, and we'll try to get to as many of those questions as possible. All right. So Philip Gorski, Samuel Perry, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Hey, thanks for having us on. Pleasure to be here. So I guess I'll, I'll go ahead and, and open up. And um, some folks uh, who have cracked the book open might be surprised to learn that Sam and I actually started working on this book in the spring of 2020. So in the midst of the presidential election season and advance of the uh, January 6th insurrection. So the insurrection, um, in a way, didn't surprise either of us. Um, in fact, it really confirmed for both of us the importance of the topic uh, that, that we were working on. Because what we saw on, in the riot that day was not was also a, a riot of images. And I think that uh, set of images might have appeared like apple and oranges to a lot of folks. But what we really saw there was a kind of a toxic fruit cocktail. So you saw the wooden cross and the wooden gallows. You saw uh, Confederate flags and Christian flags. Uh, you saw uh, Jesus saves T-shirts and. Uh, the infamous uh, Auschwitz, uh, Camp Auschwitz hoodie, right? So um, what do all those things have to do with each other? Well, um, we, we argue that uh, those are not disconnected images, but really uh, different pieces of, uh, of a particular worldview that, that we, call, we call white Christian nationalism. So let me just try to give a sense of what we mean by that term. By white Christian nationalism, uh, we mean, first of all, a certain story, a mythological story about the founding and history of the United States. They go something like this. The United States was founded as a Christian nation. The American founders were traditional Christians. The founding documents are based on biblical principles. The United States is a blessed nation, blessed uh, with power and prosperity. And the Americans are a chosen people, chosen uh, for a mission to spread freedom, democracy, religion uh, around the world. But that mission and those blessings are now currently threatened. They're threatened by uh, the presence of non-Christians, non-whites, non-native born uh, people on American soil. And so we need to take America back for God. We need to make America great again. 
That is, we need to make it white and Christian again, or at least be sure that whites and Christ, white Christians are on the top of the, the packing order in the United States. We call this story a deep story, and we call it a deep story for a couple of reasons. The first reason is that it goes, its roots go very deep in our history. So in our book, we trace them all the way back to the late 17th century. So well before the official founding um, of, of the United States. Um, we also call it a deep story because it's very deeply rooted in the consciousness of many Americans and particularly of uh, many conservative white Christians. Um, it's deeply rooted in their consciousness because it's deeply rooted in, the, in their culture and it's deeply rooted in their culture because it's something that, uh, that they hear uh, from their homeschooling textbooks or from the pulpit or from seminars that they go to or the Facebook pages uh, that they visit. Uh, it, it, is, it is a very real thing, as strange as it may seem to those, or as foreign as it may seem to those who are outside uh, in, in, in the subculture. So it's deep in both, both, of, those, both of those senses. Now, another way that we define it is as, as a political vision um, of, of the United States. Um, and in part, that simply means a, a kind of a set of political attitudes or uh, policy goals that we can uh, access and quantify using the tool, tools of uh, survey analysis and, and statistical, statistical analysis. And so um, building on the work that Sam did with Andrew Whitehead and Taking America Back for God, we're able to uh, identify uh, who uh, Christian nationalists are, how many of them are, uh, you know, which parts of uh, Christian tradition uh, they're in. And, and importantly for the political vision, we're also able to show what sorts of attitudes uh, or policy goals are, are common within this, within amongst white, white Christian nationalists. And there's not really a lot of surprises here. Uh, they're against gun control, they're for uh, the police, uh, they're against the welfare state, uh, they're for the, for the American military, uh, they're uh, against masks, uh, and um, they're, for, they're for free markets. In short, uh, the white Christian nationalist vision tracks pretty closely uh, with the Republican Party platform. Um, now, this raises the question uh, that we often get, which is, hmm, well, all right, that sounds pretty Republican to me, but it doesn't sound particularly Christian. Um, we're sociologists, we're not theologians, we're not going to say what's really truly Christian. Um, but uh, what we certainly can say is that these are views held by many people who describe themselves as Christian. And uh, we can also say that the, that the deep story itself is rooted in a particular understanding of Christian scripture. And I'll just describe this very briefly before kicking things over, over to Sam. So um, the kind of original formula for white Christian nationalism really is, uh, it, it, it's, uh, it's a weaving together of three stories that are all taken out of Christian scripture. And the first we, we refer to is, the promised land story. And the basic idea here is that the United States is a promised land, that Americans are chosen people, and uh, that uh, there's, uh, that uh, outsiders are here only on the sufferance of, uh, of those folks. And that goes all the way back to the New England Puritans, that understanding. The second part of it is what we call the end time story. And this is uh, kind of a literal interpretation of biblical prophecy that uh, the second coming of Jesus Christ is imminent and that it will feature a kind of a cosmic battle between the forces of good and evil, natural and supernatural. And we can see uh, signs of the end times all around us in, in different uh, political and social trends. And importantly, uh, 
white American Christians are going to are very much going to be on the side of the good. They're engaged every day in spiritual war for against the forces of, of darkness uh, and, and evil, uh, with which they're not going to compromise. And then the last aspect of it is what we call uh, the racial curse matrix. And this is the idea that African Americans are descendants of Ham and Ham was cursed by Noah uh, for, uh, in, in the Old Testament story and, and, and uh, condemned to, to eternal servitude. So there you have the whole package of whiteness, Christianity, nationalism, and a certain understanding uh, of, of Christian scripture. And that is really the kind of biblical foundation such as it is uh, for, for the deep story uh, of, of white, white Christian nationalism. And this authorizes a certain understanding of politics, which we call the holy trinity of white Christian nationalism. And that holy trinity is freedom, order, and violence. And that means above all, freedom, for white men to do whatever they want. Racial and gender order, which means that non-whites and women are to be subordinated. And it means righteous violence uh, when uh, folks step out, of, step out of line uh, and violate uh, that order uh, and, and, that, and that hierarchy. Uh, and that we're not just uh, pulling this out of our ears. I think um, Sam can show with, uh, some pretty hard statistical evidence. And I'll jump in there. So one of the things I think Phil has laid out so well is, is we, we talk about white Christian nationalism as both this uh, deep story and this vision. We sought to, as best we could, measure this empirically so that we could uh, assess its uh, both the scope and its association with various outcomes as it relates to the current political moment. We were fortunate to have, over the last couple of years, multiple waves of survey data that we've collected uh, among the, the American populations. These are representative samples, uh, and we were really able to track Americans over time, in fact, uh, to see how they changed in response to uh, various incidences that were happening all the way from the summer of 2019. That includes the election in 2020, that includes COVID, that includes the Capitol insurrection, uh, the inauguration, all of these things that happened subsequently. Uh, George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery's murder, uh, all of these really contentious uh, times in our uh, our current political history, we're able to to, to really ask Americans, hey, how are you responding to these kinds of things? How does Christian nationalism play in? Let me share my screen briefly, and I'll just uh, give you an idea of how we sought to measure uh, this idea. So we include uh, a variety of questions. And uh, now, can you give me a thumbs up that you can just see this okay? Is this, uh, you guys see it? All right, great. All right, so uh, in our book, we, we include uh, a series of questions we asked Americans to respond to that include both the deep story and the vision that we're trying to track. So uh, we ask Americans how much they agree with the statements like the following uh, to track the deep story. I consider the founding documents like the Declaration of Independence and the U.S. Constitution to be divinely inspired, uh, and the success of the United States is part of God's plan. Notice uh, these questions really don't have so much to do with the kind of uh, nation that you, you feel like America should be. But the kind of nation you think America always has been, that we have this special relationship with God, that, that our founding documents are inspired and God is for us and has our success in mind. But we also include questions that ask about the vision. And these are the kinds of questions that tap into the kind of nation that you think America should be. This is the federal government should declare the United States a Christian nation, a very explicit indicator of Christian nationalist ideology. The federal government should advocate Christian values, uh, should enforce a strict separation of church and state. And we look at people who uh, disagree with that. They don't want a separation of church and state. The federal government should allow the display of religious symbols in public spaces. And the federal government should allow prayer in public schools. Now, I just want to focus in for a moment on those last two questions, religious symbols in public spaces, prayer in public sp schools. Those actually sound kind of vague. And, and if, if read in a certain way, we could say generally a lot of us would want those kinds of things. I, I want to be where I want to be able to wear a cross out in public, or I want to be able to put a nativity scene uh, in my own yard, or or to or for my child to be able to pray or read their Bible in school. We found that most Americans, yet despite the the how how general those questions sound, most Americans seem to pick up on the intention of those questions that these are culture war issues. So when when the, the same kinds of Americans who strongly agree that prayer should be in public schools are the same kind of Americans who usually strongly agree that we ought to declare the U.S. a Christian nation. In, order, in other words, they understand the question is talking about a teacher-led prayer, uh, teacher-led Bible reading in public schools, not just generic Bible reading. Like that. So 
Uh, we add all these questions together, we create a scale. Uh, and with this scale, we are able to assess Americans' uh, agreement with uh, uh, Christian nationalist ideology on a spectrum, something that we try to do in the book and, and we have sought to do in the way that we talk about um, um, Americans is not to, to divide Americans into Christian nationalists and non-Christian nationalists as if there was some kind of a, a binary or clinical definition of a Christian nationalist. That, that, that we found is, 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 is about as effective as calling people Nazis or racists or KKK members or, or something like that. We, we prefer to talk about the ideology itself, right? This deep story and this vision that together produced this ideology that we call Christian nationalism that people can agree with more or less uh, on a spectrum rather than being one or the other. We don't wanna be divisive in that way. We just wanna talk about the ideology that we feel like is in fact harmful. Also, I just want to clarify, we talk about white Christian nationalism. So Phil talked about this a little bit. This is a part of the deep story and whiteness is implied here, but it's often implied and not spoken overtly. These are not, this is the distinction we often get uh, questioned about whether we're talking about white nationalists, why do we include Christian? Are we just talking about white nationalists or, or those? Actually, race is usually not foreground. It's usually not central to discussion, it's implied. Usually what is central is the Christianity part, or at least this kind of uh, ethnically specific Christianity. But let me show you why we are so clear about uh, the phenomenon we're describing being white Christian nationalism. So I, I'm just gonna give you a couple of examples from, uh, from the book and from the data that we have. This is the percentage of, of white and black Americans. This is after we control for partisanship, political ideology, region of the country, uh, education. All those things. And we're looking at how Christian nationalism corresponds with the belief that uh, white Americans face the most discrimination. Uh, you know, as opposed to other minority groups. And we find that, notice as Black Americans increase in Christian nationalist ideology, they're no more likely to say that white Americans are discriminated, so they get the most discrimination. But notice as white Americans increase in Christian nationalism in our scale, uh, they are far more likely to say that white Americans get the most discrimination, that they're the persecuted ones, that they're the ones being targeted. What is going on here? Our, our Christian nationalism measures say nothing about race. And yet we would argue that Christian language in the United States is, is deeply racialized. And so when white Americans, many white Americans hear language about Christian values, Christian heritage, Christian culture, uh, they tend to think nostalgically. They tend to think people like us. Let me give you another example. This is the percent, uh, predicted percent, again, we're controlling for all these factors, who agree with the statement, reports of police brutality against Blacks are exaggerated by the media. Notice Black Americans, as they increase in Christian nationalism, don't really change, but white Americans take off. Uh, in their belief. Why? Again, because uh, this religious language is racialized. And when white Americans hear it, they think our country, people like us, and they think we represent the, uh, the institutionalized kind of authority, police. Uh, let me give you one more. This is what Phil mentioned. The best way to stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. Notice Black Americans, as they increase in Christian nationalist ideology, do not uh, affirm this statement. Uh, but for white Americans, it takes off all the way from 10% at the very low end of Christian nationalism uh, to over 90% at the highest. What's going on? Well, white Americans who affirm Christian nationalist ideology uh, uh, seem to equate uh, gun violence with this, 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 this holy trinity, this idea that Phil talked about, that, that deviance, that people who step outside the line, people who are disrupting the order need to be stopped, and they need to be stopped quickly with violence. I'll talk about this more in a second. One of the things we, we talk about in the book, and this is one of the things we want to underscore uh, here, is that white Christian nationalism isn't just something that we, we feel like reflects poorly on Christians or something that is scary and, and look at those conservatives and their backwards views. We don't, we don't, we're, we're not trying to, to push that kind of uh, message. Really, the reason we wrote the book is because we feel like white Christian nationalist ideology is a threat to democracy. And we feel like it is so because uh, of a number of factors that feel outline, and I just want to talk about this. One, white Christian nationalism seems strongly associated with authoritarian violence, support for it. So I'll just show as this is among white Americans, as they move across our scale, we go from zero to 28 in Christian nationalist uh, belief, they're more likely to affirm things like the best way to stop bad guys with guns is to have good guys. The biggest problem with the death penalty is we don't use it enough. The, that authority should be able to use any means necessary in order to keep law in order. And if national security is at risk, I support the use of torture. Now, maybe some of these attitudes don't sound far out there. Maybe a lot of people listening uh, would, would agree with some of them. But taken together, these seem to suggest a consistent picture of, of white Americans who affirm Christian nationalism, not only being more willing 
to endorse uh, uh, authoritarian means of social control, but in fact, uh, favor it. They, they, they prefer that. They actually think it is a good thing. They, they live and inhabit a world where violence is sometimes necessary to accomplish the good. White Christian nationalism is an, also anti-democratic. Uh, it, is, it is not about maximizing the number of people participating in democracy, and in fact, it is, is about limiting the number of people who can participate. So for example, across our scale, we see that white Americans who affirm Christian nationalism are already more likely to say, we make it too easy to vote. Uh, and this is, by the way, we collected this data before the 2020 election. So even before there was any talk of a stolen election, white Americans who affirm Christian nationalism were already more likely to say it's already too easy to vote, that they would support hypothetical civics tests to vote, that they would revoke uh, felons' uh, voting rights for life. That's felon disenfranchisement, lifelong. And then this last one at the very bottom, we just asked Americans simply, is, is voting a right or a privilege? Most Americans feel that voting is a right, and they're correct. But as you see, as, as, they, as white Americans move along our Christian nationalism scale, they're less likely to be the, believe it is right, more likely to believe it is a privilege. In other words, something that can be taken away. We also find that Christian nationalism associated with what we call kind of a sacralized libertarianism or free market thinking. Our, our, uh, one of our uh, friends and colleagues, Gerardo Marty, has talked about uh, this at length in his book, American Blind Spot. And we try to we pick up on this thread. We find Christian nationalist ideology is associated with attitudes that uh, say during COVID that we should lift, uh, that we should not lift social distancing restrictions, uh, or that we excuse me, that we should lift social distancing restrictions in order to protect the economy. That it was worth the risk to the vulnerable. That citizens have the right to expose themselves, and governments do not have the right to be able to limit their own freedoms. And again, so this is freedom for us, uh, freedom for prosperity, not freedom for the vulnerable or desire to protect the vulnerable. We also find this associated with conspiratorial thinking. This is where it gets uh, even more concerning. For example, Christian national ideology is strongly associated with the belief that the 2020 election was stolen from Donald Trump, that COVID vaccines themselves have killed hundreds of people, that QAnon, this, uh, this, this, this outrageous QAnon belief that the government, media, and financial worlds are run by a ring of pedophile sex traffickers. We see as Christian nationalism increases, they are more likely to believe that. And lastly, at the very bottom, uh, we find that white Americans who affirm Christian nationalism were strongly more likely to say that anti-fund Black Lives Matter were responsible for the capitalism. And so where does this leave us? Well, I, I think this leaves us uh, at this, at this uh, last point, this last chart I want to show you. And this is, I think, where it gets uh, really concerning, I think, where our data in the, in the, in the book are pointing to, is, is, the, is the possibility of anti-democratic, conspiracy-driven political violence. Uh, we see white Americans as they affirm Christian nationalist ideology. They affirm statements like, there is a storm coming soon that will sweep away elites in power and restore rightful leaders. What exactly do they mean by that? Well, I think it's clear at the bottom. Because things have gotten so far off track, true American patriots may have to resort to physical violence in order to save our country. Now, thinking about the things that Phil shared and the, and the data that I've uh, shown thus far, uh, it really paints a picture of, of and, and again, we are controlling for all of the usual suspects. This isn't about being a Republican. This isn't about being an evangelical. This isn't about purchase. This isn't even about political conservatism necessarily, even though those things are all tightly correlated. It is about white Christian nationalist ideology uh, promoting and uh, covering and endorsing uh, a view of, uh, of our past and of our future that is authoritarian, anti-democratic, and potentially laden with violence. And so where we end is that just as the capital uh, riots were really the eruption of forces uh, that were moving below the surface for a long, long time. We are we are uh, positioned for another similar kind of eruption in white Christian nationalist ideology and its use as a political strategy among the far right uh, is not addressed head on. Thanks, Sam. Uh, yeah, so if, if you're concerned about political extremism, political violence, uh, you know, your survey instrument, your uh, data, <laughs> Uh, shows a, a clear connection, uh, but I, I do want to go back to, uh, can, you, can you bring up that first slide again that had the questions that you used? Yeah, so you talked about uh, the, the vagueness of some of these questions. And so for instance, you know, even like, so a lot of people on the Christian left, for instance, would uh, use their, use the Bible to justify their political beliefs, right? And, sure, sure. Uh, so uh, the federal government should advocate Christian values. I, I could see people, uh, Christians across the spectrum, uh, agreeing right. with that. And um, also, I mean, ju just thinking about 
myself how I would answer some of these questions. Just depending on how I interpret the question, I can score very high on your scale. Sure. Um, uh, at the same time, your scale does have a lot of explanatory va value. You know, you just showed the data. So, but why, if it is, if you do agree, you know, that it's vague, why not be, try to be more precise with the questions? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and so uh, I'll, I'll answer that. And, and this is something that we get asked and I'm certainly uh, prepared and I, I, I'm eager to answer those kinds of questions. So uh, one of the reasons that we continue to use these kinds of questions, these are similar to the questions that we, in, in fact, with the exception of the, the uh, one about the uh, Declaration of Independence being divinely inspired, uh, these are identical to the questions that uh, we use in a previous book and we've used in multiple studies. One of the reasons that we continue to ask these questions, despite their being imperfect or, or kind of vague in some ways, is so that we can establish continuity with previous studies. And so we have recently collected some data that I just got back this week uh, where, where uh, some colleagues and I have tweaked the measures uh, and sought to uh, give them a little bit more nuance and face validity uh, so that we can use them in, in, in future studies. We're testing those out. But so far, we have used consistent measures so that we can actually track how Christian nationalism changes over time. Uh, these questions, similar questions, were all the way were asked back in the mid 2000s, the mid aughts. Uh, and so, uh, if we don't ask the same questions, we actually can't see how Americans' attitudes have changed over time. And so, this is something that social scientists find themselves doing: is is repeating imperfect questions, uh, and so that we can establish change. But I, I will say. Despite the fact that I would acknowledge that this, this, uh, that that our measures don't often, uh, they often allow for some latitude and some some vagueness and some misunderstanding, I, I would say that uh, by all kinds of by all kinds of established measures for how we we determine whether scales are consistent and they're measuring what we think they are measuring, uh, these these measures all all knock it out of the park. I mean, they're very consistent. Uh, in other words, they have a, a lot of internal reliability, is what we would call it. Like. Uh, as I was saying with the prayer measure, the people who say the federal government should advocate Christian values are usually the exact same people who believe we should declare it a Christian nation, that the documents are divinely inspired, that there should be no separation of church and state. In other words, people on surveys, even though you and I might answer those with a little bit more nuance or curiosity, uh, people on surveys seem to get exactly what the question is asking them and to answer in a far more uh, conservative kind of way. Yeah, and I think one of the important findings from your previous work with Andrew Whitehead is that your your measures were a better predictor than people who self-identified as evangelical. Exactly, and and one of the things that we 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 want to hammer home, and we we did in taking America back, and and what Phil and I are doing in this book, we do from the very outset. So from the introduction, from the first few pages of the introduction, we we talk about this. This is not synonymous necessarily with with white evangelicals, uh, even though the the. Uh, you could make an argument that in some ways the circle, the, the Venn diagram is becoming a circle. Uh, it isn't there yet. And we, we, we acknowledge that conceptually, white evangelicalism and white Christian nationalism don't have to be the same thing. In fact, we prefer to talk about them like they're distinct uh, entities, not the same thing. In fact, I've, I've corrected people who have, uh, say, referred to our measure as like the white evangelical nationalism scale. Like that's not what we're, we're, we're trying to argue. It's we, we mean more of this kind of ideology rather than a specific group of people. Okay. And let's talk about the race issue, which is also the first two questions in our Q and A is about, uh, so, and in your first book, you, the subtitle just has Christian nationalism. This one has white Christian nationalism. And so, uh, you're not, you're not saying that non-whites, uh, can uh, score high on Christian nationalism. You're saying that when you include Christian nationalism with race together, it has more explanatory value than just Christian nationalism alone, right? Absolutely. And, and so this is one of the things that uh, Andrew and I have a, a paperback edition of Taking America Back that's coming out in May. And, and one of the things we talk about in the preface, uh, if, we, if we could go back, we talk about this in the book uh, at several places, but if, if we could have hammered home something or another factor, made something a little bit clearer in the book, it would have been that, that African-Americans, for example, uh, when they met, when they, they may score as high as white Americans on Christian nationalism and, and using our just really like generic Christian indicators that say nothing about race, but African-Americans clearly seem to mean something different when they are affirming those questions. When white Americans affirm questions about Christian values, Christian nation, Christian heritage, those kinds of church and state, they tend to think nostalgically for a time that when the right people held the power and held the cultural influence was Amer what America was as it should be at the time. Uh, time. 
African Americans do not think that like when when they affirm Christian nationalism indicators, they don't think about those good old days when when the right people were in charge and, and everything was as it should be. They they often more likely think aspirationally uh, for a time uh, for for uh, the values that America claimed to always hold but never quite lived up to, right? Like as, aspirationally in that regard. And so it, it is just frankly empirically, empirically more accurate to talk about white Christian nationalism rather than this generic Christian nationalism. Do you have to be white to be a white Christian nationalist? Uh, no, not necessarily, but I think you have to subscribe to a, a view that uh, uh, the kind of traditionalist Christianity that you see is implicitly associated with kind of white ethnic uh, culture, right? Like the two things, in other words, it's, it's not, it's not being white racially it, or, or even identifying it as white. It is, it is conflating white ethno culture with Christian identity and vice and saying that those two things are, are, are as America should be right. Like the, the vision and the, and the, uh, and the deep story. So uh, as I was reading this, my, my thoughts went back to January of 2020 when Trump had a rally in South Florida uh, this was a, it was in reaction to, so Christianity Today came out with this anti-Trump editorial and they like did this whole rally just to like have an alternate message that Trump is actually uh, pro-Christian and, you know, not, uh, it, it, it's somebody that Christians can support. Um, there was a lot of Christian nationalism at this rally. It was basically a Christian nationalist rally. What was significant about it, though, it was at a uh, it was at a church. It was at a mega church, and it was a Hispanic mega church uh, with a Hispanic pastor. So I wonder, you know, is there something going on in the Hispanic community that your data is just not picking up on, or what? You know, what's going on here? Yeah, I have a couple of thoughts about that. Now, um, and maybe Sam can uh, can add on to that. So, I mean, a couple of things. So one of the things, one shift that we're observing, even if we haven't really pulled on this, is that um, you could talk about white Christian nationalism, perhaps sort of evolving towards something like nativist Christian nationalism, um, where you know there are kind of nativist anti-immigrant messages, and there are there are also explicitly kind of white white nationalists. Uh, dog whistles that are being played played as well. And the reason why that, one reason why that's important is that uh, makes it easier um, for non-whites or, you know, Hispanics who may not be sure whether or not they think of themselves as white to identify with the Christian national program. And interestingly here, uh, I mean, there has been some work that uh, showed that um, Hispanics who voted for Trump were more likely in 2016, were more likely to identify as white in 2020. So, you know, whiteness is, who's white, you know, has always changed. You know, there was a time when Irish and Italian Catholics and Jews were not considered white. And now most, uh, most, most of us uh, would consider themselves, consider them, consider them white. The second important thing, and I think real, this is something that really is understu understudied is that I think a lot of social scientists tend to look at Latino, Hispanic Americans um, through a lens of African Americans and imagine that they are a kind of a monolithic group that you know really has this shared culture and experience. But this is just not the case. Uh, I mean, they're you know every bit is diverse in terms of you know when they or their ancestors came. Uh, to what's now the United States or, you know, their relationship to their country of origin, you know, as diverse in that regard as uh, European Americans are. And so we, we need more research, actually, that uh, looks at, you know, breaks this category down in, in a more, more fine-grained way. Uh, but, I mean, there's, there's no doubt that, um, you know, Christian nationalism can be packaged in a way that uh, appeals to you know people whom we would code as Latino Americans. Um, I'll just follow up follow up on that. I, I think really that's one of the next steps that we need to take in terms of like survey analysis and research on on this. One of the challenges that we face with just using survey data 
uh, to do this is 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 often we, as Phil was saying, we we don't have that kind of fine grained nuance, especially with regard to Hispanic identity. So, like in our surveys, uh, we often find that his Hispanics, uh, as it you know, I showed you those charts with how Black Americans often go flat, white Americans go up when it comes to say various kind of like uh, very like right wing conservative like outcomes and indicators. Hispanic Americans are usually somewhere in the middle, and I would ar I would argue that 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 probably reflects a lot of variation and heterogeneity within that population. So, in other words, like in our Hispanic category uh, in a survey, you could have everything from Cubans to to uh, to Puerto Ricans, right? Like who who may answer those questions way different and have something completely different in mind, uh, especially across like you're talking about like Hispanic Catholics and Hispanic Pentecostals, um, who also may interpret these questions uh, a lot differently, and so. That really is one of the next steps we have to we have to oversample for those populations and we have to ask more nuanced questions about ethnic backgrounds so that we can really tease that out. But that comes with larger sample size, bigger cost. It's just really sometimes prohibitive to be able to collect those kinds of uh, really helpful data, but that's what we need. Okay, let's let's go to some of the questions in the QA. Um, I think we uh, we tackled Jerome's question about race. Um, Andrew Fink asks, uh, in your opinion, how common is non-racist Christian nationalism? Is it an essential or near, near essential element? Or have you identified any clusters that are hard on the Christian element, but, but not the racial element? If so, can you describe the proportions? Describe their proportions. Uh, you know, I think that's a, I think uh, like inevitably whenever, whenever we're talking about, um, you know, we're using statistics or things like we're using the language of probability and tend to. Uh, and so, well, you know, let's just say I, on, on one of the measures, we don't talk about this in the book, but I'll just use, talk about the survey data that we have. Um, we do find that, say, white Americans who score high on Christian nationalism are more, like to, are more likely to affirm overtly racist statements like, uh, you know, I think there are genetic intelligence differences between races. We ask about that in one of the surveys. And so white Americans, Christian nationalism is associated with that kind of outcome, but even the even the white Americans who score the highest on Christian nationalism, not the, it's not the majority who affirms something so explicitly racist. So it's so we don't we when we're talking about the ideology, we're often talking about an association with various say like racist ideologies or outcomes. But that doesn't mean that white Americans who hold such views check all the boxes and they're just old-fashioned racists all of you know like that that is not necessarily true it's not a one-to-one -one correspondence or that kind of thing um so in terms of in terms of proportions i don't i don't have a good answer for that but i, I would just say it's it, it is uh i think what we're tracking is that uh christian nationalist ideology for white americans seems to be associated with um reactionary uh and ethno-traditionalist views of the kind of nation that we should be and the kind of people who rightfully belong and rule in the United States. And that tends to imply whiteness. Uh, and so in terms of like percentages of the population, I, uh, I really couldn't say, but that's, I think that's the best answer I could give. I just, you know, add uh, tag, add something onto the, onto the tail end of that, which is you know, about the complicated ways in which race and religion are um, used in a kind of an ideological shell game um, in, uh, you know, by, by white Christian nationalists. So like on the one hand, you have white nationalists who know that it's not expedient to say that they're white nationalists. And so they instead talk about defending, you know, Judeo-Christian civilization or traditional Christian Christian values and they do this uh, often in an utterly cynical way um, just as a political tactic. On the other hand, I think you have folks who are not who are Christian nationalists but um, you know aren't you know don't harbor sort of conscious racial prejudices or anything like that but nonetheless uh, have a vision of uh, you know, American culture as, as white culture and the way that they will often talk, that they will talk about, well, we're just defending American culture or we're just defending the American, American way of life. But what they really have in mind by that is not a kind of a pluralistic and inclusive and diverse culture, but it's a more homogeneous 
uh, and, and a hierarchical culture. And so it's complicated. I mean, do we want to call that racism or even more provocatively white, white supremacism? Um, I mean, there's no doubt that it is a way of asserting the culture of superiority and dominance of a particular, particular group, even if it's not articulated in explicitly racist terms. So um, there's there's a couple of questions in here. Uh, I'm going to try to combine them, but it's it it deals with this issue of okay, what 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 can Christians or pastors do about th this ideology invading our own churches? Is basically the gist of some a couple of these questions, um, and so and just um, from my perspective, you know, it's an it's a it's an issue that we need to deal with from several different perspectives theology, psychology, and your perspective is sociology. So we're, we're getting it from one uh, way of looking at it, which is helpful. Uh, so uh, for instance, so uh, Pastor Anderson asked how as a pastor, can I show the people in my congregation that have been sucked into this type of ideology, see how quite Christian nationalism is not compatible with what Jesus taught. Uh, and then we also have a question from uh, Pastor David Ritchie, who has written a book on this from a theological pers perspective. Yep. Um, he says, thank you for your presentation. Um, in your book, you argue that in order to avert uh, white Christian nationalism ideology driving the nation off the cliff, we must create a popular front defense or broad coalition that spans the ideological width from thoughtful conservatives to democratic socialists. How do you see those broad initiatives come together in a cultural moment that is so polarizing and divisive? Uh, relatedly, can American Christians and churches play a role in defending against the anti-democratic influences of white Christian nationalism? And if so, how? Yeah, uh, so I'll, how about I answer the first part of that and I'll kick the part about coalitions, uh, coalition building, uh, Bill, so from a pastoral perspective. Um, I actually, I don't, I don't, I don't think it's 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 necessary, strictly speaking, for pastors from the pulpit to address white Christian nationalism by name if if they don't feel like that's a that's a like that's a that's a charged buzzword right now. So like white Christian nationalism is something that is as an as an idea as a concept. It's something that gets bandied about in the popular media. People sometimes do a poor job of defining that kind of thing, or or it's or it's felt like, hey, is that a slur against any Christian who wants to uh, vote their values or exercise influence or be an agent of change in their society, uh, which we certainly don't uh, argue in the book. Um, but I, I think what they could do is, I think from the pulpit, I, I think from, from, from their uh, position of influence, is to, is to draw a distinction between what is, uh, what is authentic Christianity that, that, that is I don't mean liberal Christianity. I mean like authentic, like way you know, put in quotes here, but like authentic Christianity that I think is tethered to a, a biblical New Testament understanding of of what is the Christian's job on earth, right? Like to to be uh, to be a witness, to be salt and light, to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to be an expression of Christ's love here, to to exhibit the fruits of the Spirit. Like none of those things are connected to Christian nationalism at all. Like Christian nationalism is is really steeped in intolerance and is steeped in violence and is steeped in, in I think, you know, uh, limiting access to uh, who can participate in, in society, the very opposite of, of, of the things that Christians would like to be associated with. So I think as a, as a pastor, I mean, I think pastorally, my, my advice would be to address uh, uh, the distinction between what it means to be a Christian and to be an, an American and how the two are not synonymous and how, how, how being a Christian transcends nationality and transcends race. Uh, and and that being a good thing, and that a Christian citizenship is in heaven, that doesn't mean that they shouldn't be uh, agents of change and positive influence in society. They absolutely should be. But but how do you how do you how do those values correspond with uh, really the sacred creeds of what is what are what are Americans as as citizens committed to legal equality, uh, full civic participation, um, uh, that we all have legal rights, natural rights. Even. And, and so, uh, I, I, you know, I, I think it doesn't have to be addressed explicitly from the pulpit. You don't have to take our book and wave it from up from up front and say, you know, read this book, everybody. You know, like as much as as great as that would be, uh, I, I think a, a more shrewd and strategic tactic for pastors would be to, you know, I think focus on on making Christians who know who know better the distinction between Christians and the Christian far right. 
Great. So I guess I, I've got the, the, the quest, question on, on, on coalition building. So two, two things. Um, I mean, first, I think it is important to be completely clear eyed about the gravity of the moment that we're living in, that there is a genuine threat to American democracy, that uh, there is a white Christian nationalist right that has taken a sharp authoritarian turn that may claim to be conservative, but isn't, is radical and revolutionary and uh, authoritarian and, and increasingly ready to engage in violence. I think that, um, you know, the scale should have fallen from everybody's eyes on January 6th, but it's uncomfortable to look at. And it's sort of easy to slip back into complacency. But I think that the next two to five years are going to be really decisive um, moment in terms of whether or not American democracy survives or, or whether we continue down the slippery slope to some kind of post-democratic, uh, more authoritarian future. And, and to be absolutely clear that there are a lot of folks um, who want that, that that's exactly what they want, that they, uh, at least until recently, looked at Putin and said, looked at Putin's Russia and thought, hey, that doesn't look so bad. We've got a strong man who's going to stand up for us in the driver's seat. That seems good. Um, so I mean, first is to understand the gravity of the moment. And second is to understand what that means, uh, that it may mean um, setting aside some pretty deep political agreements for a while. Um, like um, I doubt uh, a, a lot of folks on the never Trump, uh, you, know, Republic, you know, previous Republican spectrum, you know, Bill Kristol or Charlie Sykes. I'm sure we disagree about a lot about foreign policy and, and economic policy. Uh, and I would like to be able to continue to have those arguments with them, but there are some people who just want to shut that argument down, who don't want us to have that argument, who just want to dictate to us uh, what, what policy is going to be. Um, and so I think that means that um, we have to be willing to, again, set aside some of our political differences uh, at, you know, and uh, ally with each other around a shared commitment to, to liberal, liberal democracy. And, that's, that's important uh, to secular Americans because uh, you know their their freedoms would definitely be threatened. But let's be honest; it's also a danger to religious Americans. Um, you know, if you think that uh, Christianity is going to thrive if religion is if religious freedom is taken away, um, I've got uh, a couple of historical lessons for you that that is not the way this plays out that you are going to see an anti-church, anti-Christian backlash, the size of which you have never seen before, that will delegitimate uh, and destroy American Christianity for generations. Uh, David Haspel asks, what, what does this movement mean when they say Judeo-Christian values? I think he's curious about the inclusion of Judeo in there. Honestly, I think the answer is nothing. That just means our values. Um, I mean, this idea of Judeo-Christian, the quote Judeo-Christian tradition is uh, kind of a legacy of the Second World War. Um, you know, before you know, before that, uh, Jews were always thought of as as as, as outsiders, and um, you know, I I think it's it, it's just a way of uh, sounding sounding more inclusive. I mean, there are of course. Um, you know, some conservative American Jews who, you know, are kind of fellow travelers or you know, kind of second class passengers on the Christian nationalist uh, train. Um, and this also legitimates that to that to some extent. And I suppose one other piece of this that um, is, uh, also came up, comes up in uh, Andrew Fink's question in, in, in the Q&A is, the connection between Christian nationalism and Christian Zionism. Um, that could be the subject of a, of, of a whole other webinar and it, it's the subject of a number of, of interesting books, which you know, I'd be happy to put into the chat if, uh, if, if people are interested, interested. But 
you know, uh, as many folks will know, being sort of pro-Israel um, is um, very common uh, amongst white white Christian nationalists, but they're not necessarily because they're, you know, particularly you know open and, and inclusive, but more just because they think um, that this is all part of you know the end times and you know the countdown to countdown to to apocalypse and you know there are uh, some uh, clever and cynical politicians on the Israeli side who were quite happy to take advantage of the situation uh, to sort of rally uh, rally support and you know keep the keep the money uh, flowing into Israel's defense budget. Uh, Jerome asks, is it conservative? Um, I assume he means conservative in the ideological sense rather than sort of a cultural uh, identity type of conservatism, but is white Christian nationalism conservative? I mean, not by, it, it's not, so if, for me, the roots of conservatism really go back to, uh, you know, the English statesman Edmund Burke. And, you know, conservatism meant exactly what it sounds like. It meant, you know, conserving, uh, what is familiar, what is traditional, on the view that there is a kind of wisdom of crowds or wisdom of history that, you know, there are certain, uh, the strange as they may sometimes seem, some of our values and our institutions and our identities, uh, they're not the way that they are for no reason. They're, you know, they are the way that they are because they somehow uh, conduce to our, our, to our well-being or to or, or, or to the common good. And I think that's, um, you know, a, a position which is uh, certainly intellectually defensible, even if it's not one I always agree with. Um, but what we're seeing is, can really only be coded as reactionary. And this has more to do with the extreme thinkers of Burke's period. Uh, so somebody like uh, De Maestra, uh, the sort of Franco-Italian reactionary thinker who was an advocate of, uh, you know, the alliance of, uh, of throne and altar, of church and state, of monarchy uh, and papacy, and of a kind of a ruthlessly violent enforcement uh, of that order. Um, lots more could be said about this, but I'll just point to one of his most famous essays, The Hangman. And he saw the hangman, that is the executioner, as the embodiment of political order. And I'm not sure what more you need to know, uh, except uh, just maybe a reminder to uh, that gallows that we saw on January 6th, which as we now know uh, from the work of the J6 committee was not just symbolic, it was set up for none other than Vice President Mike Pence. And I mean, I'm just imagining Edmund Burke's reaction to a hostile takeover of the U.S. Capitol. I mean, he was writing, he was opposing the French Revolution, right? And so the whole notion that that's conservative, it, you know, from a traditional conservative sense doesn't, you know, uh, make any sense. Yeah, um, I would agree. It's just I, like it, uh, in, empirically, there's a strong association between like conservative ideology, like it just, you know, people who identify as conservative. But I would say like Phil, it's, it's probably it's it's not Burkean. It's 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 not you know uh, David Brooks kind of conservatism or even or even that of like Yoram Hazoni, who you know I think is 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 actually a pro kind of like ethno or cultural nationalism for intellectual reasons. Um, I, I think it would be best to crack reactionary is a great word for it. It's not conservative. It's anti leftist, right? Like it's 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 extreme anti anti leftist and all of the things that imply there right? the disruption of that kind of gender racial political economic order. All of those things it is detests it is anti the an antithetical uh, to that anti-liberal anti-modern yeah. anti-egalitarian anti-democratic right. anti-pluralist the list yeah. goes on that's right uh, yeah you to kind of deal with this a little bit uh in the in the book but the, i mean what's going on with these sort of pro-authoritarian catholic thinkers on the right now I mean, is is this? Should we think of this as uh, a, a distinct sort of phenomenon, or is this? What, what's the relationship here with the with white Christian nationalism? So I, I 
this this is a, this is an excellent question, and um, you know one thing which I learned recently from reading a forthcoming book called American Heresy by uh, Jerome Kapolsky of Georgetown, the Berkeley Center, at Georgetown University, is that there is and has always been a space that's even to the right of white Christian nationalism in uh, in the United States, and that is a view which sees the political order as a divine order in which uh, kind of cosmic hierarchies must be translated into political hierarchies. And this has consistently been a view which has rejected the separation of church and state, which has rejected the separation of powers, which has uh, rejected uh, religious freedom and, and religious pluralism. Uh, in the name of a vision uh, in which church, state, religion, politics uh, are all completely uh, melded, melded together. Um, and you, you, you get versions of this vision, um, you know, such as uh, in this recent book, uh, you know, Common Good Conservatism by uh, Harvard Law School professor Adrian Vermeule, who is a Kind of an advocate of this, which, you know, they're all, they sound very vague and high minded, and it's about common values and, and human flourishing. But there are a couple of tells here. So, one is that there's absolutely no way to achieve the kind of unity that these folks envision without top down authority and hierarchy. Absolutely no way. And not without coercive authority as well. The second tell though is who are they fanboys of? They're fanboys of maybe not Putin because he's a little too crude, but definitely a Viktor Orban uh, in Hungary. I mean, some of these folks like Rod Dreher, one of the editors of uh, the American conservative, you know, I mean, by now he must have a Hungarian Greek card. He's over there so much. Tucker Carlson, as you may remember, did a week-long uh, broadcast from, from Budapest in which he uh, tried to sell uh, Orban's vision of illiberal Christian democracy. Um, but, you know, for, for some of these folks, when they're not on, on Fox News or, you know, publishing in national newspapers, um, you know, people who they really admire are like, uh, you know, Franco, Spain's Franco right, or um, a, a le the lesser known uh, uh, sort of similar figure in, in, in Portugal from, from the same, same period, right? So what, you know, what they have in mind is something that's even to the right of Christian nationalism, uh, in which there's one kind of Christianity and not different kinds of Christianity, and in which there's not even a facade of dem democracy left anymore, but uh, essentially a move towards some kind of authoritarian di dictatorship. And in private, these folks are not particularly coy about telling you what they think. All right, we're close to the top of the hour. Let's get one more question in. Uh, Brad Duran has a question about civil religion. How much of today's white Christian nationalism is a continuum of American civil religion and particularly the mythology that permeated US culture during the Cold War era? Well, it's funny. Uh, that's really how I first started thinking about religious nationalism. So I wrote this book uh, five years ago called uh, called American Covenant. Just really, truly by chance, I just happened to have it sitting here on my desk, um, in which I tried to draw a distinction between civil religion and and religious nationalism, at least the way that I define civil civil religion there is as a mix of civic republicanism and prophetic Christianity. And by prophetic Christianity, I mean something like Martin Luther King or, or Frederick Douglass or uh, Roger Williams. It's this kind of more aspirational understanding where there are you know, certain kinds of values uh, that are rooted in Christianity that you're, uh, you know, that form the foundation for your, your, political, your, your political vision. You're not trying to control uh, the government, but, but you're trying continually like the prophets trying to call 
uh, political authorities to account the way that Martin Luther King and, and other great civil rights leaders did. And civic republicanism, you know, uh, you know, we would think of as a kind of more active understanding of democracy. Democracy isn't just showing up every year, two years, or four years uh, to vote, or you know, may, maybe occasionally uh, tuning into the news. But you know, being more actively engaged as a citizen, and it's also, I think, this is crucial. It's, it's recognizing, uh, as people, I think, increasingly do, that you know, like a healthy democracy requires a certain amount of, of civic virtue. Like institutions are not enough. You know, if you, you you can have all set up all the guard democratic guardrails you want, if you've got people who are just you know, uh, driving high on their own supply of white Christian nationalism all the time, they're going to run right off of the road or try to just take those guardrails down, down completely. So, I mean, that, that's sort of the vision. And, um, you know, I think that that was uh, an important one. It, it, this maybe it's not a bad way to sort of wrap up. I mean, I think what I was trying to articulate with this idea of civil religion is that kind of the best version of the American political tradition drew on both secular political philosophy and on certain kind of Christian Christian values. Um, you know, the sort of value that we place on, for example, on, on equality. I mean, it's not obvious that we should, we should value equality. I mean, that comes from uh, the, the central values of all the Abrahamic faiths that people being created, created in the image of God, and therefore being in some fundamental way worthy of respect, deserving of dignity, uh, and uh, to be treated, therefore, uh, as uh, as our equals. And that's something that you can embrace as a non-Christian or, you know, a, a non-believer. But I think, you know, we have to be clear that that is one of the roots of the of, of some of our most central American values. Philip Gorski, Samuel Perry. The book is The Flag and the Cross. There's the cover. Thank you for joining us. Thanks everyone for joining us. Appreciate your time. Thanks for having us on.